Um, hi everyone, today is the 31st of March 2020 and four of us have thought it might be an idea to get together and have a few discussions around dealing with um, issues that arise for property managers with coronavirus. Um, we're all getting a huge amount of questions and we've got a lot of questions ourselves so we thought if we put a couple of heads together and try and provide you guys with a bit of information it, it may assist you in, in um, doing what you do. So. My name's Charlotte Pascoe, I'm General Manager at Stockdown Lego and we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves and what we do. Oh, I'm Sardin Smiles and I'm the CEO for Property Management for Harcourts and I'm the Director for Harcourts Move, which is a property management only business. I'm Hannah Gill from Independent in Canberra um, and run property management for the group there. Hi, I'm Leah Kelnan. Uh, I am the Director of Metro Property Management in Melbourne and the current REIB President. Beautiful. So we thought we might start off and talk a little bit about people. Sardner raised a couple of great points before. So Sardner, do you want to jump into what you were talking about earlier? Yeah, sure. I think, um, look, there's a lot of business issues that are happening right now, but I'm, I'm a big believer that we've got to look after our, our people first. And property management traditionally has been in an area where you know, we've done a survey around this where we know that a lot of our people work on the front line and the high stress and, and, and a lot of pressure. And I think with something like COVID-19 happening, when you, and when you look at how quickly it happened, it took 12 weeks. It's 12 weeks for the entire globe to be impacted by something and it brought countries to an absolute standstill. But what it's meant for a lot of our people on the front line is it's changing the way we work in business, it's changing how we work with our families, our friends. It's changing everything. And we come into work every day and there's something new. And that puts a lot of pressure on people anyway. And so in my business, we now have a, um, something called an FFT. I'm not going to swear because that's probably not the right thing to do, but it's a flipping first time. You can use the F however you like. But pretty much everything we do is a flipping first time at the moment. And I think one of the things that we need to do, and I'm, and I'm happy for everyone else to jump in as well, is, is, you know, we've really got to focus on making sure our people remain healthy. So are they eating well? Are they sleeping? Are they exercising? Do they have someone else they can talk to? Or if they need a mental health plan, we need to make sure that we look after our people on that front line around that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I know even with, um, you know, we've got some team members that are based in Manila and um, I checked in with them last week and that was a really confronting conversation because they're really, really isolated. You know, a lot of those dwellings that those people live in, they don't have balconies, they don't have gardens, they're confined in a four square, you know, flat. So that really highlighted to me the, the huge importance of making sure that checking in and you know if there are going to be things around you know reduced hours which is potentially what we're going to need to do with our team instead of cutting them down from a straight five days to four days perhaps run to half day so that they've actually still have that important process of getting up getting dressed preparing themselves to work and then look at what the rest of the day brings rather than them being self-isolated in a in a small place where they live, work, breathe, everything. And, you know, that's not good for their mental health. And it's not good for anyone's here mental health either, either, but at least we've got the benefit, I suppose, of being able to go for a walk or, you know, do these go meetings. You know, there's, mm. Yeah, go in the backyard. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really great point, Leah, that whole um, routine and that purpose is so important, you know, to reduce people from five to four days right now to give them a three-day weekend in that sort of isolated environment isn't necessarily the best thing for their, their mental health and well-being at the moment if, if we can avoid it obviously absolutely and i think you know while we're isolated and everyone's feeling like they're alone if they are in isolation we're all actually isolated alone together so it's not that we're on our own and we're the only ones who are locked up in this small little cell yeah. We're actually all alone together. And one of the great things, um, my sister is, uh, is from overseas and she's just come back to Australia in self-isolation. And she's been having regular catch-ups with her friends on Zoom with a glass of wine. So the Friday night drinks has now moved to Friday Zoom drinks. So they all sit around and have a bit of a chat and share stories. So they feel like they still have that connection. Um, and I think that's really important, you know, on a personal level, 
It's not just about staying in touch with your team members. It's not just about staying in touch with the clients. It's also about staying in touch with your family and your friends. And it can be lonely if you live by yourself, particularly, um, you know, single parents. Um, I think they can be doing it pretty tough at the moment as well. Um, you know, there's so many different situations that we're all in. We deal with people every day and their situations vary so much. Um, but I think the, the big message that we all sort of came out with was that um, you're not alone in this and don't isolate yourself further than the physical isolation. Make sure you're still reaching out to other people and connecting with them and finding that support. Yeah. And there's lots of simple things that we can implement in our day-to-day -day lives to enable that sort of um, rhythm and process and, and, and motivate us to want to stay connected with people, you know, and, and we've provided some fact sheets for our people, but things as simple as getting changed out of your PJs in the morning and um, having some ambient sound in the background and not starting drinking at lunchtime wherever possible. Little, little things like that in a routine is actually really vital because the more we look after ourselves and we have that routine, the more inclined we're going to be to want to connect with people. Whereas if we sort of lose that rhythm and routine, I think for ourselves, it's really hard to feel motivated to want to connect and want to collaborate with other people. I think you sort of get into that quite a dark headspace quite quickly potentially. Yeah. And I think if you've got teams working from home, and, and I know there's a real mixture around that where we've got some businesses where everybody's working from home, yeah, and we've got some businesses where we've broken up into teams. I think if you're a leader or a general manager or a business owner around a business that is now fractured a little bit, so you've got people kind of everywhere, it's important that you find ways to stay connected. So, you know, three weeks ago, we just put a work from home policy where we've all been on WhatsApp as a chat uh, group anyway in the business, but that has become even more important for us now to keep everybody connected. Um, but for people's safety, you know, when they're working from home, um, if they happen to do a private appointment, which we're only doing private appointments and one-on-one -on -one basis if it's an open for inspection, but to make sure they've gone there, they've texted that we've arrived and then they've come back and texted us. But also, you know, we have a 9.30 Skype morning, uh, Skype meeting, we have a one o'clock Skype meeting, we have a 4.30 Skype meeting, and at 4.30 on a Friday, we have drinks on a Skype. You know, it, it's just to just to have those regular check-ins with your team members. Otherwise, they will get lost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you, you guys both manage really big teams that are spread across multiple locations. And, you know, that has its own challenges in itself. But I think, you know, sharing that load among leaders is important. But also that daily check-in and hearing from, from the leader is also really essential because it makes everyone feel that they are valued and that there is someone looking out for them. Yeah. I think Leah's gonna take a really important phone call, clearly. <laughs> I know, well, there's a few things I think legislation-wise that she was talking about before. So what I might do is just pause it for a second and Leah will be back and then we'll keep going. One sec. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, hi ladies, sorry, I'm back, sorry. Oh, we were having fun talking to an empty chair. It was fascinating. We were giving us no feedback whatsoever. Um, yeah, sorry about that. This conversation for those who are listening because it's quite hilarious having the blue for real, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, Sadna, you had three things, and also, um, Hannah, you've got an email that you send out. Do you guys want to go through that? Yeah, so um, so I think one of the three things that we, we keep talking to our people about is, you know, in, in a time of crisis where everything is so new and so different and so intense and it comes at you so fast, one of the things that we have to do to cope with it as humans is to normalise it. And we normalise it by giving it a label, you know. Uh, whatever label works for you in your business, my FFT is my label. So, so we... We need, to, we need to give it a label. The second thing is I'm looking at my wall because I've got it on my wall, so I remind myself about this every day. Second thing is you've got to put it into perspective. Mm. Yeah, it's hard. In fact, it's shit. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm really pissed off that I'm, my normal life has just been ripped away from me, literally. And every day, more and more of my freedom kicks away mm. from me and I still got to run the business. So you know what? Let's put it into perspective. This is how I'm feeling. And it's okay to feel like that because the reality check around that, which is the third thing, is it's going to be like this for a while. I can't change it. So I've really got to focus on the stuff that I actually can have a valuable yeah. impact on. 
and that for everybody's going to be different. I was talking to the girls e earlier. I have an app. Some of you have heard me speak before. We'll know it. And you can just download it from, from Apple, but it's called the five minute journal. And one of the things that I do, and I do it a lot, lot anyway, but one of the things I'm doing more consistently now mm -hmm. is just doing the one thing that has given me joy for that day. You know, and yeah. so I took a photo of the four of us that I'm going to put up today and the laughs that we've had because we've got to do more of this with each other mm. so that it energizes you for the next day. You, you cannot go for the next six months from one intense drama to the next yeah. and think that we're going to get through it whole. It's not going to happen. Mm. Mm. Couldn't agree more. Susanna Toop has a really good analogy about that. She talks about us in property management having a full cup and property managers run with a full cup you know all the time because that's the nature of the job it's it's cat it's maxed out as possibly can be because we're there to service people and so when that extra drop hits that cup things overflow really quickly and I think that comes back exactly to what you're saying ensuring that there's space and that there's that reflection there's that perspective because that that's all out of our control isn't it so how we react to that is what is in our control yeah. I think one of the big things that we we've been talking a lot about is um, the fact that it's it's actually not your fault. And this goes down to, you know, when you start in property management, one of the big things you get taught about is being able to compartmentalise and separating if hot water systems burst, you know, we were really worried about calling that owner and saying, oh, you know, you've got to fix it or the tenant hasn't paid their rent. And when they would get upset or frustrated at the situation, we were very good at um, personalising that. And I think as you get um, further and further into your career as a property manager, you become better at being able to separate it and saying, this isn't my fault. I think this has to be amplified because right now we've gone from, you know, a couple of issues, but usually some positive stuff. You do some routines and you go about your day-to-day -day basis and you've got a good relationship, so things are great. I think now one of the issues um, that, that we've been finding in our group is it's just everyone's being hammered, you know, the tenants don't want to pay their rent, the owners are angry, we don't have the answers because the answers aren't out yet. Um, so we're trying to, to scrounge to get ideas. I think taking, you know, Leah, you used the word calm earlier um, when we, we jumped on this, about creating a sense of calm for yourself and taking a deep breath in. And if an owner's going to get upset or something's going to go pear-shaped, take a breath and just remind yourself, this isn't actually your fault. You didn't create the coronavirus. We're all in this together. Take a breath, understand that that person on the other end of the phone is, you know, has probably just lost their job. And if their partner has too, it's a horrible situation to face. Or there's an illness or, you know, people who have um, compromised immune systems already, there's going to be that anxiety. You know, people are going to work when they want to stay at home to protect their family, whatever it might be. We're all under a huge amount of stress and pressure already, but it's not just one person, it's it's your entire portfolio, both landlord and tenant. So, you know, the one thing that I would continue to go back to is if somebody's having a, a vent, consider it their vent, it's not personalised and it's okay to say, we yeah. don't have all the answers yet. We're doing everything we can. We want to get you the best outcome. Um, but remember, deep down, it's not your fault. So compartmentalise, mm -hmm. separate it. And when you finish for the day, tune off and just, enjoy the fact that, you know, you're at home, you're safe, you're healthy, you've got those people around you and, and look after yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, uh, A, property managers are control freaks. We all know that. And, uh, you know, I look at all of you and I know you're all the same, just like I am. Uh, but, you know, what Sarge said is right, you know, for us, all of a sudden, we actually have to, you know, take a breath and, and stop and smell the roses. And maybe you maybe that's what this is partly about, that we actually need to go out and take a walk and, you know, separate it and have the processes in place to deal with it and not take it personally. And so there's all these different things coming at us continually. And it's really hard because you don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. um, but like we've all said, that's okay. You're not meant to have the answers. The problem is we are now a society when we want the answers, we just Google. So, you know, or we watch the news, you know, they're probably the two worst things you could do at the moment. Yeah. Hannah, you do an email just in regards to that. Do you want to? Yeah, so um, obviously, uh, while we're working remotely, pretty pretty keen um, from my perspective to be able to check in with the team every day. So each morning, just sending a quick update of anything sort of breaking overnight, not not lengthy by any means, and, and some sort of positive or funny quote. 
Um, and every evening about four o'clock, I'm sending an email to the team uh, with my peak, my pit and my score out of 10 for the day. So my highlight of the day, my low light of the day and generally how I'm feeling. I'm doing that to prompt my team to then get back to me and that's been really powerful because one, it gives me the ability to personally check in with anyone who chooses to reply to that. Um, but two, it also enables us to really identify if someone's struggling a little bit more, if they've just potentially had a bad day or if they've got a really good story of, you know, that's gone well or a good outcome that we can then share with the rest of the team. So it only takes me, you know, two minutes to send my email. They get back to me over the evening and I get back to them once, once I hear from them. But I think just having that personalised touch point at the moment is, is so vital. Yeah. Um, particularly when you've got newer staff as well who are probably feeling even more anxious than the rest of us. Yeah. yeah, and just having the, the scheduled Zoom meetings, you know, that's something we're alternating our team from some being in the office and some being at home. And I know the novelty of them being at home is going to wear off very quickly if we go down to, you know, consistently five days at home. So yeah. having that Zoom meeting and something for them to actually look forward to so that they've got that interaction because we, we, we crave that interaction all all the time so that's a really big adjustment that people have been, are having to make and I think as well one thing I will say is you know a lot of uh, obviously our positions are in more of a leadership type role but if you're working in an office and you know and you like that idea for example of um, of sending an email around and finding out there's nothing to say that you as a property manager or a junior property manager whoever can't send that email out and say guys let's try and be positive take control of your situation and if you know, the people you're working with might not buy into that. We'll find some friends that you can do it with um, because there is the mental health. There's obviously your role um, that you need to do and you, you know, you want to work as a team. But if you want a personal level, if you don't feel like you've got that where you're working, that's okay. Don't throw the towel in and isolate yourself. Reach out to some friends and say, guys, I've heard this great idea and this is what I want to do. Um, because it's nice to focus on the good. You know, I, I do it with my kids. What was great about today? I've done that for a long time. Um, and we talk about around the dinner table what you enjoyed. Well, this is just a slight variation of that. So it's about finding the good, no matter how how hard and crap your day is. That there's probably something nice that came out and giving you an opportunity to focus on it. Yeah. Um, Last week we did the find the funniest um, coronavirus meme. You know, just to just to stop taking everything so seriously. And oh my goodness, for those that are on Facebook with me, I can't believe some of the things that my team found. But it just made them, you know, just feel real again. Just not so, you know, stressed and caught up. But yeah, there's lots of things you can do. I think as well, we are going to get through this. This isn't. We're not going to be living coronavirus for the next 20 years. So we will go back to not what we used to do. I don't think any office or property manager or salesperson or any industry really will, will go back to what it was two months ago. But I don't see that as being a bad thing. I think you know, there's a lot of people in our industry who have been. Um, doing things the old school way. So we've done this for 30 years and we don't need to change. It's actually making everybody, we're all having to take our comfort blankets off. There are things, you know, I'm not the most tech savvy people for anyone who knows, uh, of, of people for anyone who knows me. Um, I'm really proud of myself that I've worked out Zoom. Um, but for me, that's something that I've had to just kind of, you just have to do it. So for a lot of offices, for processes, for systems, we've got offices that we're dealing with who are now, you know, they're moving to the cloud, they're trialing new things. So use it as an opportunity to, to grow yourself as well. I don't, I don't see it as long-term having a negative effect. Hopefully it's, it's a really positive thing on a personal level um, and a professional level. Um, so in terms of processes, uh, we talked a little bit about the processes and Sadna, you know, you, you mentioned that there were some things that you've put into your business in the last few weeks. Did you want to go into those? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, three weeks ago, it seems like such a long time ago because so much has changed in the last three weeks, but, you know, when, <laughs> when it all went pear-shaped. Um, one of the things we first looked at straight away was, you know, what, what are the things that are going to hit us? coming up and and we knew that people you know particularly when you started to see the lines at centrelink and and you know companies started closing their doors and massive massive retrenchments all being stood down we knew that we would get a lot of people asking for rent reductions and one of the things i keep saying to people is at the moment we're all working in the gray so and property managers don't tend to work in the gray very well we, mm. we tend to work in the black and white well, so we've actually got to turn, change our working mode a little bit and be okay to work in the grey. So 
you know, for me, um, it was about making commercial decisions that was going to be sustainable for all parties, the tenant, for us and for the owner. And so we just came up with, you know, the critical areas. And for us, it was around, you know, communication, arrears and rent reduction. So the three things that we knew we had to do really, really well, really quickly. And so we, we created a form. I've had it up on all forums. If anybody wants it, email it. I'll send it to you. It's not a big secret. It's a basic form that basically goes through the tenancy and it asks all the questions around, you know, have you been laid off? Have you applied for job seeker? Uh, you know, are you entitled to the latest uh, package that came out yesterday with Josh Feidenberg? It goes through everything. And then we can make a valuable decision with the, with mm. the owner in terms of whether this tenant uh, needs a rent reduction or not, you know. Um, so we had 12 in the last week and we've only approved two. And so, but, but we've put everybody through the process. And we've also explained to the owner and the tenant that right now while we're working in grey, we are going to follow the legislation because we've got to protect the owner in terms of, you know, landlord insurance claims, etc. However, given the circumstances that we're working in now, we're happy to look at some sort of rent reduction. Uh, and, and that's just been in our business. You know, we haven't pushed back doing arrears for five days or anything like that. We still follow a normal arrears process. And every single week, a communication goes out from me to my owners and my tenants, which is a really brief update on, here is what's happened, here is how we understand it, and this is what we're doing in the business. Now, there's no right or wrong, because we haven't, there's no playbook for this. We haven't had a pandemic before. This is the first time. So, you know, we're all making decisions mm. in the grey. Uh, when that changes, I'll come back to you. But I think it's the really quick, low-hanging fruit kind of stuff that you've got to act on in terms of your clients, but have a real structure in process within your business on the key things that are really going to impact the commercial side of your business really quickly. So what does the next 10 days look like? What does the next 15 days look like? What does the next 30 days look like? What does the next 60 days look like? If you're leading a business as a business owner or department manager, you need to start working on that now. Yeah. And Sandra, with your um, tenant uh, hardship form that, that you've been sending out, how have... How that been received by the tenants obviously they're all feeling stressed and anxious but they have been have they been happy to provide that additional information for you yep so what we did is we did a frontline um quick scripts and dialogues video to our property managers to say here's how you have the conversation you know really get to understand the situation the tenant is because from their perspective they just they've stood in line at centrelink for two days next to people who probably have the COVID 19 you know, or they've been on the phone or the internet doesn't work for them. They're under a lot of stress personally themselves. And so we've told our guys in the front line to have enormous empathy around that and understanding. And what they want from us is to hear from us, we're going to fix this for you and we're going to make sure mm. that you don't have to pay rent or you're going to have a rent reduction. That's all they want to hear. We can't. So... A lot yeah. of our tenants, once we explain to them, you know, I hear you, I understand that this is important to you, I want you to fill in the form because it'll help me help you and help me talk to the owner. And I promise you that if you can get the form to me, I'll come back to you within 24 hours. And then what we do is we have a service and we put every tenant's name down, the owner, what they ask for, whether they're approved or not. And it's a property manager's job then to touch base with them um, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, and we have different things that they have to do around that, so that we are always on top of what's happening in that tenant's life, right? Um, and our tenants, every single one of them, have been very grateful. And the ones that haven't come back to us, you kind of go, well, clearly you don't need a rent reduction. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. How are you finding that with, um, with, I mean, one of the things that we were going to talk about is rental payments. I think that's one of the biggest issues there. I think every property manager in Australia has received the call saying, hi, my owner doesn't have to pay their mortgage, so I now don't have to pay my rent. Um, so how, you know, what are you guys doing um, to combat that in terms of tenants and, you know, Leah, what, what have you guys been doing in terms of scripts and dialogues dealing with your tenants? 
So we have, um, you know, as of now and, and as of the last couple of weeks, we've been immediately referring the, um, the tenants back to Centrelink and to MyGov and to see what additional financial assistance they could potentially get. And there are other financial um, providers out there, whether it be through the Salvation Army or, or different government bodies. And, and they seem to have been missed a little bit off, off a lot of dialogues and a lot of communication because they're there to be able to assist people as well. Uh, we have, we're asking for people to find out where they can obtain some benefits if they can. There'll be some people that um, can potentially borrow money if that's suitable for them, depending on their circumstances. And then making, um, you know, coming back to us with a proposed payment plan. What is the challenge at the moment? And I've seen three, in fact, in my office today, is the request of, well, I, I'd actually like three months um, free rent and my lease to be frozen. And, and I feel like that that's fair and equitable for everyone. Well, I'm not sure how you work out those formulas or those figures, but it's not. <laughs> Um, and therefore, it's in having that tough conversation to say, well, okay, let's have a look at your rent. Look, what's it going to be? There will be absolutely a portion of the rental market that go into financial hardship. But on the other side, there will equally be the same number of landlords that will go into financial hardship. And, you know, and you'll see that. And I think I've seen the more the angst coming from owners more so than tenants at the moment. Uh, so they're the sort of things. And that's the process we've got in place. The job, uh, I think it's called the job seeker package. So there's that incentive now, uh, and, and you know that's that. They're the rules today. We'll see. We, we'll see what the rules are tomorrow, and that's how we just have to continually to play it. But it has to go back to the owner as well to say these are the situation. What can you financially afford, and, and go from there. It's just com it's just conversation. And with your owners that are reaching out who are anxious, is that because they've lost work themselves or because they're worried about their tenant losing their employment? It seems to be they're concerned about the, the tenant. So they haven't indicated that they've lost their own employment. Um, I, it's also beat up through a lot of the media. And, you know, so again, for us, you know, us and, and anyone else in that leadership role has to be making sure we're using that right dialogue and right language. Um, because it stresses your staff, it stresses partners, it then stresses our owners. Um, so it's just that check-in. And, and for us, we've said, okay, this is this is it. We've outlined our process. We'll come back to you if we hear anything. But at the moment, if you don't hear anything, you have to assume it's okay um, because people will tell you. Probably my favourite that I've seen today is, um, I haven't lost my job, but I'm just wondering if I can have a rental re um, rebate or I can go forego this month's rent. Uh, I'm not sure again where people, it's almost that fear of missing out, you know. Free out, rent, this is great. For free, so I should get a <laughs> one of us. Yeah. 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 I think also it's, it's to assess this as a whole tenancy, because you know, one of the things we found out last week is one of the people who applied for it was a husband and wife. The husband had lost his job because he was a chef and the restaurant had closed down. But the wife was working in a very secure corporate role, earning one hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. So when you assess it as a whole tenancy, you you know it, it was a very different outcome. Yeah. Um, and then you know, yesterday I think Shelley processed one. We had three tenants in a property. One had lost their job. So it was about adjusting how they pay the rent, as yeah. opposed to the owner potentially offering a rent reduction. So I think we've, as property managers, we negotiate. We know how to do that really well. We're just doing it in a different environment. Yeah, and it's about asking those key questions. Yeah. You know, just because one, you know, whether you know, whether it be husband, wife, or whatever the structure is, if one has lost their employment, okay, let's what what's the other scenario? Because I, I, I guarantee you that information isn't coming through. So it's that training that we need to be saying to property managers. Well, let's go and have a look at the lease, see what the other one. Let's go back to the application. Let's yeah. make sure that the information is true and correct. I don't want to be cynical because I'm not cynical, uh, but you need to go back to the application to check it. But if you were a bank, Leo, you'd be doing exactly the same thing. We're no exactly. different. We're not. We're yeah. not money lenders, you know. Yeah. So, hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so Hannah, we're going to pause. Hannah's just got to duck off. Um, just a second. Um, Hannah had to run, so there's just the three of us now. <laughs> um, but we wanted to finish this discussion because it is a really topical one for all property managers at the moment. 
um, just dealing with tenants. So in terms of processes, um, one thing that we've done um, is obviously we're putting out to the group that you've got to make sure you're following your processes. So if a tenant falls into arrears, you still have to make sure you're serving your notices. You've still got to do your um, SMS, phone calls. I would probably change that process slightly based on what's going on. So the moment that a tenant falls into arrears, instead of allowing them three or four days, um, get straight onto it. The people who are repeat mm. offenders, you know your portfolio, so you know that you're repeat offenders, you kind of go, oh God, you probably just fall into arrears again. But if somebody's gone into arrears that never has, that would probably be more of a concern, um, knowing that this isn't normal behaviour for them. So by picking up the phone and actually having a conversation with them, it's, you know, if I, if you think about it on a personal level, if I'd lost my job and I wasn't able to pay my rent, it'd be a really embarrassing conversation, particularly if you've never been in that situation. So I think we've Correct. got to be compassionate in the way that we're dealing with it. Instead of calling up and going, why don't you pay your rent? Um, particularly on day one, reach out to them, send them a message and say, hey, look, I've noticed your rent hasn't come through. Just wanted to have a bit of a chat, make sure everything's okay. But get them to a point where if they're communicating with you and you have that relationship, like everything in this job, the better your relationship with the tenant, the more information you're going to get and the easier the process is going to be in most cases. Obviously, we do have difficult tenants, but if you're having a quality conversation with them at the start, you are more likely to, um, to be able to get a resolution or at least work it through and give the information to the owner and saying, look, I've, I've left them 15 abusive messages and they haven't called me back. Make, opening that door for them to communicate with you. So then you can have a more um, informed discussion with the owners. Um, Sardin, what are you guys doing with your landlords in that in that case? How are you dealing with the landlords? In land terms of arrears? Yeah. Like, well, what's your we haven't had any issues yet because we've just... Well, it's what you said. I mean, you just, just got to stay on top of it. Like, we start messaging our people on day one. And, you know, whereas in the past, you by day three, we're talking to the landlords right now about how hey, your tenant hasn't paid any rent, but we are on it and we will come back to you pretty quickly on why they haven't paid their rent. Because I think by day three, that owner is going to be anxious about the fact that my tenant hasn't paid any rent because they're not going to pay it anymore. So we've got to understand that the processes we used from four weeks ago, mm -hmm. they no longer exist, you know. So we, we've got to be, everything's going to come forward from a time perspective. Yeah, and I think also from a property manager point of view, there's a, there's a few of the tasks that have changed and we think about, that you know, we're not leaving the office to go and do routine inspections. Exactly. So you have to think about, you've got that time now and sort of work out how you can use that time and it might be that you work through and check in with each of your owners and each of your tenants if that's what works for your portfolio. It might be that you know, you're looking at your rent, the, the rents for each property and going, okay, well, that, such and such is due tomorrow. I'll flick them an email or send them a text or give them a call, find out, you know, just to make sure the payment's coming through and then I can let the owner know. So there's other things uh, that a property manager can be doing in this space because I, I guarantee you, and I saw it already today where owners have said, well, if I'm getting, if I'm applying a rent reduction, does that mean that you apply a reduction in your management fees or what will potentially come over the next few months is, well, if you're not performing the routine inspection and you're not doing the video aspect of it, that some agencies have just slowly introducing, is there going to be a rebate on my management fee for that small component of, of the role? We've already um, had that for some, for some yeah. offices that have stopped doing routines. Yeah. Oh, great, if you're not doing yeah. a routine, can I have a reduction in my fee? Like, hmm. no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's right. But it's coming. It's yeah. coming. Yeah. But Absolutely. I think it's, you know, if the owners still see that you're working hard, I think this comes down to, you know, there's nothing worse. Let's take the coronavirus out for a moment. There's nothing worse than when you lose a management of a property because the owner turns around and says, we don't do anything anyway. You are, you're under, you know, under the water pedaling madly trying to keep things going, but you don't communicate with the owner about what you're actually doing. So if you have a conversation, yeah. if you leave a message, if you, if you come to an agreement, if you, whatever it might be, if you're communicating with that, the, with the owner, they're seeing value in, you know, the value right now might not be the same tasks you were doing six weeks ago. The value in what you're doing now is keeping them going. Um, yeah. And reminding them that, you know, 
this, this will pass. So what we're doing now is going to be different to what we were doing a month ago. But in six months, there's obviously going to be a bit of catch up on what we're doing with our inspections and reviews and all of these types of things that we're going to have mm. to address in a different way at a different time. So right now we've got one focus and that's keeping rent coming through or coming up with agreements and managing that process because down the track, we need to make sure you still have a tenant is our number one priority because we want that rent yeah. to come through. Even if it's a reduction in rent, it's not ideal, but something's better than nothing. Um, we talked earlier about um, VCAT uh, with payment plans. And one thing that I'd insert here is if you do come up with a payment plan agreement with a tenant and a landlord, make sure it gets officiated through VCAT because I've had it in the past, you know, years ago where you, you come up against a, um, an, you come up with an agreement, the, owner, the tenant and the owner stick to that for maybe six weeks, whatever it might be, and then they default on that agreement and then you go to VCAT and VCAT go, great, we're going to put a payment plan in place because the one that you had wasn't officiated. So one thing I would suggest strongly is if you do come up with any agreement, make sure VCAT stamp it because it's actually a payment plan that then allows them less wriggle room down the track. Are they doing it in a timely way at the moment though, Charlotte? You've got an eight week, 10 week delay. Yeah, so there is a, um, so VCAT's doing uh, telephone uh, hearings. So we know and they'll give you a schedule of what it's gonna look like and you have to upload all your information and then they call at a certain time. And if you miss that call, you then go back into the list. One of the suggestions which actually came from the Stockdown Lego group today was you know, in the current environment with VCAT, what they would do for adjournments is that there's normally a member that's um, sitting in chambers and the adjournment process goes through, they get all the information, tick, yes, that order can be adjourned for six, three months, six months, whatever the process is. So one of the suggestions moving forward with VCAT is why couldn't we have a very similar process that it's done in chambers with regards to you know rubber stamping a payment plan. Um, so we've already reached out to the head of VCAT. Uh, so you know he was certainly keen to explore the practicality aspect of it. Uh, so I, and I think you know even moving forward that is a potential improvement speed up. Um, yeah a great new process that potentially we can see. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and just in terms of um, the eviction process, uh, obviously every state's different. Um, Leah, do you want to have a, a, a quick chat just about the different states and um, explaining that what we're talking about, what we're applying here might be Victoria. Hannah was obviously from Canberra, but do you want to just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so when we started recording this webinar for the 31st, the current process was that the Prime Minister had announced that there would be a mandate on commercial tenancy or the evictions of commercial tenancies and residential has been thrown around in that mix. It hasn't hasn't been fully processed through the Victorian government. So we're waiting to see what happens. Um, we are expecting the Victorian government to come up with a, a plan. We think the commercial aspect will go in first so that there's better rules and processes around it. We know in Tasmania, which Sardina will be able to confirm that they have processed a, a mandate on their evictions. I think it's for six months, maybe. 120 days. And, oh, so four months. Yeah. So that then is precluding people to be evicted relating to the COVID-19, but still allowing uh, people who experience family violence can still have a tenancy ended and can also for, for malicious damage. I think they're the two components that uh, Tasmania are working with at the moment. So one of the reasons, and this is, this is the frustrating part for property managers because everyone is such a control freak and they just want to know until we can get, get on with it. There is such a complicated process. So it's not just, okay, we, we create a one rule and that will fix every short payment of rent and that will fix every investor. Because there's multiple investors. So you think about the investors who um, you know, don't have any mortgage on the property, they don't rely on government and they only receive the rental income. So what's the fix for them? And then the 80% of investors that are your average mum and dads who do have a mortgage on the property and rely on the rent for, to pay those, uh, make those payments. 
You then have you know some small portion which are multi owners, and yes, they still rely on the rent for cash flow, but they might get some benefits through land tax. So there's all these different variations. So with regards to the eviction process to mandate it, the other component that needs to be considered is what happens if I'm the owner and I need to move back into my property? So you can't have a blanket rule that says there'll be no evictions for 120 days, six months, 12 months. There has to be guidelines around all the different scenarios. And that, whilst I understand how frustrating it is, that is why the Victorian government, and I expect every government, is taking their time because they don't want to get it wrong, but because it's so complicated. It's not just a simple fix. Absolutely. So I think, and, and, and what, what, you, what you say, Leah, is, is spot on. There is no simple fix and we're dealing with, you know, so many different states with so many different legislation and so many different parties. So, you know, we go back to what we talked about in the beginning, which is get used to working in the grey, find yeah. solutions that are going to work for now, don't get hung up on who can be evicted, who can't be evicted, you know, yeah. all, all the things that people are looking at at the moment for direction because that's how we work. Um, follow the legislation as much as you can. Get used to working in the grey and and try and create an environment where you're having the best outcome for as many parties as you possibly can, can including yourself. And hopefully in the next week, we will have more clarity than what we do now. I can't see it, you know, we're sitting here a month from now and still saying mm. we have no clarity because that won't happen. We will get clarity. And, you know, I think the government just released a statement about five minutes ago saying that they would have federally uh, residential and commercial tenancies we looked at by Friday. Now, they said that last week, but yeah. that happens not, you know. But I think we've just got to, I keep going back to this, just keep working in the grey, people, because if you fight that, you're actually going to do your head in. Mm. You create more angst for yourself. And we go back, you need to be calm and, you know, go through your processes. And, you know, it's, we, we, just, we just have to move a little bit and, and adjust. That's all. Yeah, be agile. And I think mm. just continually, as you said, just try and workshop ideas discuss it every owner is going to be different so some owners are already i don't know if people have come up against this but some owners are already saying you know what i don't need the rent so call my tenant and say they don't have to pay the rent now mm. we've got property managers who are going but hang on a second they haven't even asked for a rent reduction let alone free rent so keep the rent coming through uh, but i think you've got to look as we always do in every situation in real estate in property management particularly you've got to really sit there and go okay what's the property doing that's in the middle you've got a tenant and a landlord so there's three things to consider through this process but it is just about making sure that um, that you're working with all three. You're continually being agile. If something else changes tomorrow, well, we deal with that then. But today, this is what we're at. And I think so long as you start every conversation with your tenants and your landlords, starting with, look, this is where we're at today. This is how much information we have. It may change. Yeah. But for today, this is what we can do. And we will update you if it changes. But we're going to do everything we can to act in your best interest and protect your asset. And with the tenants, we want to keep a roof over your head because... If we go, nut, go absolutely nuts and start evicting every tenant who falls into arrears, that's going to form another problem. And that's that how do we backfill those properties? So if we lose a certain part of the market, which is your retail workers, hospitality workers who might be at university, share houses, lower income, for them, if they don't have a job, they're not going to get another property. So they're going to, I expect, either move home, move in with a friend. So we're going to see potentially a reduction in the tenant pool out there um, so if we're removing people from that from that price bracket um, out of these properties, we're going to have quite a number of properties empty, but no tenants to backfill them. So best outcome would be to work a solution, keep those tenants in there so that hopefully at some point when work picks up again, you know, be it in two months, four months, six months, play the long game and explain to the owners that we have to play the long game here. Um, we don't know how long again, but we're going to do our best to, again, do everything we can with the information we have to protect your asset and your best interests. Um, and we're always here. It doesn't matter if we're at home, in the office. It doesn't actually matter where we are. We've all got phones. We're all available. Um, but I think just asking for a little bit of, you know, please bear with me while I try and get an answer for you. I think everybody's, a, I think our landlords and tenants are also experiencing the coronavirus in their workplaces and in their lives on a personal yeah. level. So if you bring it back to the fact that we're all in this together, we all have to work together. 
um, then hopefully you'll have a little bit less um, solicitations and issues. So, um, obviously Hannah's jumped off and, uh, and we're going to as well. Um, but I, I expect that we'll probably jump back on again together. If you've got any um, questions that you want us to deal with potentially next time, please contact any of us, Sardner from, from Harcourts, myself from Stockdown Lego, and, uh, and Leah through any means. You're a jack of all trades. We've got the REIB president, however you want to find her, she's everywhere. <laughs> the world. <Yeah. laughs> but thanks everyone, that was wonderful. Thanks for that.